But you don't have the power. You haven't got that supernatural power. Because that supernatural power comes with the experience they had on the day of Pentecost. So we continue with the history of Philip. Jesus was so real to the disciples after he ascended to heaven because as he had said to them, I will come again to you. I will come to you. We will make our abode with you. My heavenly Father and myself will make our abode with you. So they recognized that even though he was in heaven, as they had seen him ascend, that nevertheless, he was in each one of them. And he was so close that they recognized him as the same friend that they'd had when he was on earth. Only now, it was more glorious. Jesus said, it is better for you that I go back to the Father. And it was far better that he had gone to heaven for them and for us than that he stayed on earth in this sense, that he was there in a spiritual form and that he could be in every one of them. So they obeyed his word. They went out to different countries of the world. They went out in poverty. They had no support. They did not go out with any organization or denomination or, or anybody saying to them, we will send you money and we will help you. I can remember when we first went out to the mission field that God had given us in a supernatural way a promise. He said, you will have supernatural sustenance, supernatural support, and supernatural transport. And we believed it. We were going anyway because we'd sold everything just about that we owned and went with five suitcases, uh, two children, and uh, we just had our fares back to a, a place in Australia that had no airport just so we could get our, into the country on a visitor's visa, it was. So we know what it was to go forth at the words of Jesus because he did not say, get some money and then go. He just sent his disciples out. Now I'm not suggesting that every missionary should do that. We had just been led to do it, that was all. And many another one has done more than that. I think of the founders of, of China Inland Mission. Uh, Hudson Taylor went out on virtually nothing. And uh, there were others, the WEC people, uh, the founder of them, I just forget his name, did the same thing, he had, and his wife. They were very wealthy and they sold everything they had and gave it to the Salvation Army. Then they went and founded the Worldwide Evangelization Crusade in the end. So there is the supernatural presence of the Lord with the, everybody who does some kind of ministry, even if it's across the street or if it's the next town, if it's another country, it doesn't matter. We have the supernatural promise of the Lord that he will be with us and that he will sustain us. I remember that when we passed at the first church, just to let you know that God does work supernaturally today, as probably most of you have already realized. But I just want to encourage us all for the simple reason that the early apostles really knew the supernatural working power of their God, almost daily, I would say. And yes, I have to say on the mission field, and even in our ministry in Australia, and wherever we've been, all the countries we've been to, we have seen the supernatural acts of God uh, time after time. So we were pastoring our first church, and it was just very small. And one morning there was a supernatural message in tongues with an interpretation that really was directed to us. And it said that we would be 
preaching to multitudes. And I heard that and I thought to myself, that is impossible. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, what we think is impossible many a time is God's possibility. And it worked out that we have uh, ministered to many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people over the years. So we are looking into what happened to Philip and all the others. And I remember before we went out that somebody had said, a prophesied uh, uh, at a Bible school, the, a leading pastor actually, and said that the Lord would fill many with the Holy Ghost. And that was the ministry that really the Lord poured out upon me and, and used me in particular. So these things that God promises supernaturally, if they're really from God, they do occur. And i just like to give this testimony. That was in 1970. In 1992, uh, with my present husband as my first one has gone to heaven, we were in the city of Bandung, West Java, holding meetings there. And that was the first city where I had gone in 1970. And at the end of one of the meetings, a woman came up to me and she said, aren't you Sister Bonnie? I said, yes, because now my name is Fawkes. She said, I got baptized in the Spirit under your ministry in 1970. And she said, do you remember praying for two little boys who were blind, that I brought the mother along and you prayed? And I said, why, yes, I do. Well, she said, you know, they were healed. Now, I had not known they were healed. 22 years later, I find out they were healed. So when we do obey the Lord and do his ministry, whatever it is, we never know what wonderful things he might be doing that we have known nothing about. So we just need to persevere and be more like Philip, more like Paul, more like Peter, James and John. Because the Apostle Paul even said to us, you be followers of me as I am of Christ. So that's in the scriptures. So we're at the point in our story where Philip has arrived in Carthage. And on the Sunday, he went up from the ship to go into the city and to drive out from there the ruler of Satan as the Lord had commanded him. If you remember and you followed the previous videos that the Lord had commanded Philip to go to the city of Carthage and drive out the ruler there. Now this is what the story is all about. And I'd like to turn our attention to Revelation chapter 2 verse 13 where the Lord said to John in relation to the message to the church in Pergamum he said where Satan's seat is. And I'd like to speak a bit about some of the evil things that there are in, to be found in paganism that was found in the, the city of Pergamum at the time when John wrote the book of Revelation. You see, Alexander the Great had gone there conquering. And of course, eventually, his Grecian religion became part of, of the Roman religion. They were all combined, as we learned in our studies, going through the book of Revelation, where finally in Rome, through the Caesars, there, were all, there was all the paganism, first of Babylon, then of Persia, then of Greece, all joined with the paganism of Rome. So it was very, very wicked indeed. But most of us who've lived in our 
modern countries that are, have been uh, often very much Christianized or sometimes not much Christianized. But the Christian influence is there. And heathendom as they knew it then is not in our countries. It's in some countries. It's in quite a few countries, even in Asia, South America, Africa. To, and even you'd find it in New Guinea and some of the islands of the seas and in the West Indies and so forth. Now, it's an amazing thing that when you go into it, you see that this was the kind of thing that was in Pergamon. They had a god of fertility. And that meant that they did fertility rites in the temple itself, in the utmost evil. Now, there's something about the mother of Alexander the Great. She w uh, was married even. At the time, she still slept with serpents. It's a matter of history. She was a priestess. And Alexander thought that he was the son of Zeus Ammon, a god. And they worshipped Zeus in the city of Pergamon. So the Greek influence had come there because Zeus was a Roman god uh, as well. And uh, there were snakes there. There were snakes around the temple. There was a temple there full of snakes. They worship snakes. And when we were in ministering in an Assembly of God church in Penang at one time, and the uh, altar call was given for those who needed prayer, there came forward amongst the others a young man of about 18. He had a demon. And as hands were laid on him, he fell to the floor. And he started writhing like a snake. It turned out he'd been to the snake temple. And the snake temple, of course, is full of snakes. But that doesn't affect you unless you're a worshipper. He'd worshipped there. And so he became demon-possessed. When we were in the city of Madurai in India, I knew a pastor there who had a congregation at that time of only about 1,400, I think it was then. It's increased. Now, he told me that about a 1,000 of those people had come to him because they'd been to the heathen temple on the Tuesday. On the Friday, he had a meeting for deliverance. And of course, it was around the city. The heathen knew. If any of their relatives had demons, take them along to this pastor. He'll get rid of them. Well, he did. But then the people will go to his church. And uh, they weren't necessarily worshippers of serpents. They certainly were worshippers of the cobra. I knew a woman in one of the churches, she said to me, I used to be a worshipper of the cobra and every morning I used to put a, a plate of milk out so the cobra would come and drink it. They worshipped such creatures that are types of Satan, aren't they? Satan's a serpent. He's called the serpent. And in the form of a serpent, Satan tempted Eve. So there is great evil amongst those kind of people in the city of Pergamum. And Jesus said, where Satan's seat is. So what do you think it would be like in the city of Carthage? And going back to the story, it says that as Philip was entering the gates of the city there before him. He saw, it says an Indian man, then in brackets black. Of course, you have to realize this is translated from manuscripts going back well over a thousand years. And so maybe we don't know how many copies. There were a few copies. And anybody making copies can make 
little mistakes. But personally, I think it was an Indian man because of the fact that the Indians do follow the worship of snakes. And this Indian man was sitting on a throne with two serpents twined around his loins and a wreath of vipers placed on his head and his eyes were like coals of fire and blazing flames issued from his mouth and from the place where he was sitting a smell of smoke went up and troops of Indians were standing on the right hand and on his left. Now uh, th this is this is written by somebody called Lady Queensborough, obviously an English woman. And she's talking about Hinduism, Brahmanism, she calls it. And she says that everywhere there is the phallus. Well, we have to say, we have seen that on idols. In fact, idols all over the place. They've got this horrible phallus sticking out of the mouth of the god. And she says there were sacrifices to the sun, the planets, and the household gods. That does go on all the time. Even in Indonesia, you see that in the Chinese homes. Sacrifices to the gods. If you visit a non-Christian home, which you don't do very often, but they are there. And that comes back to the fallen angels of Genesis 6 verses 2 and 3 where they mated with the, with the women and took them as wives remembering that Jude speaks about the evil of their doings because the angels left their first estate well these people in this kind of a situation worship the sun, the planets and the fallen angels may be, and I think it's a fact, many of them were angels of the stars, of the sun. Because God, in his power, had not only created the world, but he had created the angels to do his messages in the ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, creation of the world as he had created it. For instance, the winds have to blow, the stars have to shine, so forth. He used angels. And she talks about this, initiation. And this is what I would like everybody to listen to. Then you will understand that the history of Philip is not an exaggeration. It's not an imagination. It's an actuality. And amidst all the confusion, this woman says, a sudden explosion was heard, followed by a dead silence. Flashes of brilliant light were succeeded by darkness. Phantoms and shadows of various forms, surrounded by rays of light, flitted across the gloom, some with many hands, arms and legs, others without them. Sometimes a shapeless trunk, than a human body with the head of a bird or beast or a fish. All manner of incongruous forms and bodies were seen, and all calculated to excite terror in the mind of the posthumous. Now I want to say that in Genesis chapter 6, it speaks about the fact uh, in the book of Jasher that the, the wicked pe people of that day uh, somehow or other did something with the fish and with the birds so that they would mate together. And you often see from archaeological objects that the gods have, might be human, they might have a, a bird head or an animal tail or something like that. There's a mixture. Well, this is what these people see in vision. They're really seeing the demons. And it speaks about that he's the, the character of the destroyer.
Now, there's something that I want to mention. Yoga should not be engaged in by Christians, and sometimes it is. I to tell you about yogi stuff. The standard Indian book on magic gives detailed description of how to produce catalepsy, somnambulism, hallucination, and ecstasy, and so forth, because they use drugs. That's what many people today call yogi stuff, and it is mostly based on breathing exercises. So we are dealing with the darkness of the world of Satan, out of which we have been delivered. But you know, there's something wonderful about the giving out of the gospel in those lands. Many a time, somebody will come to you and say, I used to be a Hindu, but now I'm a Christian. Or, I used to be a Muslim, but now I'm a Christian. You see, you're really in the world of darkness when you're in those places, but you want to know something? The Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So what do you feel when you go to those places? The presence of Jesus. You don't feel those satanic things. They might be all around you. They could affect you, maybe. I, I would not like to say they have ever affected me, but I would not like to say they haven't in some form. I, do, I really don't know. But I do know this. The presence of the Lord Jesus is there. The presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's what... Uh, uh, Philip was experiencing. Even though he saw all this, he was full of the Holy Ghost because he'd been filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. He'd received supernatural power. Everybody who's filled with the Holy Ghost has supernatural power. If you are not, you don't have it. If you are not filled with the Holy Ghost, you can be filled with the Spirit of Jesus because you're under the gospel. Christ lives in your heart if you're a faithful follower of the word of the gospel. But you don't have the power. You haven't got that supernatural power. Because that supernatural power comes with the experience they had on the day of Pentecost. They had been waiting for it to happen. That's why it says when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Because they had been waiting all those days uh, since Jesus had ascended for the Holy Ghost to come and they knew he was going to come. So when it did arrive, there they were. And the huge sound like a wind filled all the temple. They were in the upper room of the temple. There was a huge building. And everybody in the temple heard that wind and it possibly carried outside some people believe it carried outside and went through the, win the, the streets of Jerusalem. But in any case, the Holy Ghost had come. And they received the Holy Spirit in power, who was the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he entered them, he also gave them the gift of miracles. Because then they had the miracle power to be able to speak in tongues, which they did. So thereafter, they had access to all the gifts of the Holy Ghost, including the gift of miracles by which you cast out demons, including the gift of miracles by which you, you get people filled with the Holy Ghost, and in, as well, the gift of healings. And through those two gifts, you can get people healed. Anybody has access to the gift. Because it says in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, covered earnestly the best gifts. And that's one thing we did that was right. Did a lot of things wrong, I'm sure, over the years. We coveted earnestly gifts of the Spirit many a year and found the gifts of the Spirit in operation, well, I'd say from uh, let me think, uh, 50 years, on and on, the gifts of the Holy Ghost in a supernatural way. 
Now, maybe you won't have 50 years. Maybe the Lord might come before that. Or you're already uh, 50 and you don't think you live to 100. And we all hope we don't have another 50 years here. We do hope the Lord returns before that. But we all hoped that when I was a child. So you never know when it's going to happen. So this is then what happens, that as Philip the Apostle entered the gate, the ruler was overturned and fell backwards, and all his troops upon him. Now, I don't think that those things are impossible. Those kind of things happen in the ministry of people who were filled with the Holy Ghost. And it is obvious that this is such a supernatural action of God that the Indian, that the ruler, is full of Satan. Here's another place where Satan's seat is. Satan's there. Satan rules the city. Satan rules the people to such an extent that they obviously had never come to Christ. They were completely without the gospel, the whole city of, yes, there would have been a few thousand people there anyway. So he falls over backwards. We have seen people falling over backwards in the charismatic move. Well, I will make no comment except to say this. I think it is in Isaiah 25 where God says they will speak a little, they will speak this and they will speak that. Then he says they will fall over backwards. And he says that not as a blessing but something else. I was in Sri, uh, Sri Lanka once in Colombo and uh, with the Assemblies of God there, and the pastor used to have healing meetings. And I might say he went off to Australia after the first week and left me uh, conducting them for a couple of weeks. But this first night, he had a row of people to be prayed for, and one of them fell backwards. You know what he said? He said, oh, he's demon-possessed. That's the fact. We have seen the demon possessed, as they were, were full, of de full of some kind of demon, fall over backwards. And this ruler fell over backwards. Then the apostle speaks to him and says, Fall and rise not. Thou portion of the fire and child of Gehenna, accursed from of old, Thou bitter one, who in all thy days didst never sweeten, thou hater of the just, and enemy of all righteousness, deceiver of Adam, bringer of death upon Eve and upon all her children. The apostle is speaking to Satan. Now we get an example of that in the ministry of Jesus. When there was the man coming out of the graveyard full of a legion of demons. Jesus is about to cast out the demons, a legion. I don't know how many, that's hundreds. We knew a woman once who had 38 that we knew of. But you see, people make a mistake about what Jesus said. Jesus said to the woman, and it's in the, uh, to the man, sorry. Jesus said to the man, and it's in the Gospels, what is your name? But you see, he wasn't talking to the name, to the man. And he wasn't saying to the demons, I want to know your name. He didn't need to know them. We do not need to know the names of demons to cast out demons, as the charismatics have often done. You don't go wrong saying, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? Before you can cast it out. He just cast it out. The man never said what his own name was. No demon ever said what was 
its name. And Jesus, I believe, had asked that for the simple reason he was basically saying to the demons, you're of no account. What name have you got? They wouldn't dare reply. And as the man would hear it, he would be saying to the man, you're you, you're not the, de not the demons. You see, there is a distinction. I remember being in a meeting in India once and there was this woman lying on the floor because you see, they do fall over in many cases, not always. People can have demons and not fall over. I've seen thousands of people with demons and not fall over, but they got delivered. I didn't deliver them. The Lord Jesus did through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I might say most of the time I never said a word. It was the action of the Holy Ghost. Jesus was saying to the man, take no notice of these demons. You're a man. You're an identity of your own. And so the, the apostle is just doing what he had seen Jesus do and recognizing as Jesus had said to him previously, go and get rid of that ruler of Satan, that Satan is there. So the, ru uh, the ruler speaks to the apostle and he says, oh, what have I done? Why, why, why are you saying this? Where, where is my sin? I tell you what, I stay in the city and my troops wander about on the whole earth and come to meet to the third hour of the day. But to a single one of the disciples of Jesus, they do not come near. This is what he's saying. Because I have warned them, etc., etc. So this man goes on like that and he continues talking to Philip, which I won't uh, go with. But I do want to say this. He said that Jesus, this Jesus has slain me by his death. He has humbled me by his exaltation. My crown he has taken away from my head. My throne he has overturned behind him. My power he has taken from me. And in my glory he has given to others. He has made me a treading underfoot for children. See, Jesus said you can tread on snakes, didn't he? He was talking about demons. And he has made me an offscouring and filth unto infants and the simple. Now then, this comes. And the whole city was standing and hearing what the ruler was saying but no man saw him, save that the apostles saw him through the spirit of holiness. See, this is going on in the unseen realm, it would seem. Now you might say, well, that's strange. Well, yes, it's strange, but you know, it's in our Bible. It's in our Bible, in the Old Testament. So you can all turn to it if you like. A historical and spiritual fact recorded in 2 Kings chapter 7. And we look at verse 8. There were leprous men who went into this city to find that it was empty. It was the city of the camp of the enemy who had come down against the children of Israel. And something has happened. The leprous men went to the camp, they ate and drank, and they carried gold and clothing away. Then they said, we had better come and tell the others. Now this is the reason that the camp was empty. It says in verse 6, For the Lord had caused the army and army to hear the sound of chariots, and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, 
The king of Israel has hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to fight against us. So they fled away in the twilight and abandoned everything. You see, the Spirit of God can do wonderful things, as the Lord did then. Now that, that army heard something that really wasn't there by the power of God. It didn't happen. But they heard it as if it had happened. And that's a strange miracle. So, then we think of Paul on the way to killing off the Christians. And suddenly, a voice from heaven speaks to Paul. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that the men who were with him heard the voice, didn't understand what it was saying, but saw nobody. So here we have the situation in the city of Carthage, where the whole of pe where all the people of the city are standing. They can hear exactly what the ruler was saying. And of course they heard Philip if they were close enough. But no man saw him. And then this is what Philip continues saying. I bid you in the name of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, the mighty God, who sent me against you, arise, take up your throne, and lead away all your troops, and you shall go forth from the city. For lo, 3,000, for lo, 3,795 years, you have enjoyed yourselves in it. Now that's amazing, because this was about A.D. 34, and it takes us back about 4,000 years before Christ, which is what many Bible scholars today consider would be the number of years that elapsed between creation and uh, when Christ came. And in that hour, the ruler rose and took his throne and led away all his troops. And they went forth from there, flying in the air and wailing as they went and saying, Woe is to us for you, O ruler. Woe is to us for you, O king. And they ceased not from weeping, all of them, while they were going, till they entered the city of Babel, and there established the throne of their ruler. Now that's amazing. Because Satan didn't exactly come from Babel. There were powerful demons there. But that's where he was taken. That's where he had to go. And it is from Babylon that the evil that's filling our world from demons and Satan and the fallen angels in the rulers of our countries and particularly in the neocons, particularly in the Judaists who are ruling our world and holding millions in poverty and wars and so forth, centered in Babylon. And everybody in the temple heard that wind, and it possibly carried outside. Some people believe it carried outside and went through the, wind, the, the streets of Jerusalem 